Thank you very much, Gemma. So let's get moving. We've got quite a lot of slides to get through today, um, more because they actually contain quite a lot of information so that hopefully you can take them away um, and they can help you later on. Hopefully you don't need to take too many notes. Um, so this is really what we're going to be looking at today. So we're trying to um, avoid disputes, um, always best if we can, um, but if we can't, um, looking at how to resolve them. So we're not actually going to look too much into dispute resolution, except in terms of thinking about what dispute resolution you might go to if any negotiations fail. So we will be looking at negotiations and therefore you know, dispute resolution in that context. Um, note um, that where I'm talking about contractors, um, I'm also referring to subcontractors in a subcontract situation as well. Now, the next two slides, um, well, A, probably, you know, really depressing. We'll look at these and wonder why we ever um, do any construction work at all. Um, but they're probably all fairly common to you. So this is basically, you know, 25 years of my life, um, what, what I've found um, causes challenges on construction projects, shall we say. So lots, lots of issues. Sometimes it's a mixture. So basically a lack of preparation, which often manifests itself in starting on site too early, um, which then means that nobody's actually really ready to start. It sometimes means we have lots of changes, variations, which causes issues, um, or contractors not really ready, so doesn't really hit the ground running, etc. Was into letters of intent because very often you find that letters of intent are viewed because somebody wants to see some tangible progress on site. But the reality is that um, quite often when letters of intent are issued, the, the parties aren't actually ready to get going on site. And that causes problems. Um, buying worker experience, um, you know, my advice to contractors and subcontractors is don't, don't do that unless you have a clear idea as to how pricing it you're going to do the work um i've seen lots of um disputes where um that has caused in terms of not being sufficiently experienced to do the work which is never great um and also where work has been bought and then two years later as the project's finishing everybody's looking at it and thinking why haven't we made any money on this and they've forgotten that it was um you know it, it was you know effectively buying the work um, for, for clients, employers out there, lowest price isn't always the best. Um, and sometimes I think it is very apparent that um, clients, developers go for the lowest price. Sometimes they don't really um, understand what they're buying or what they're getting into, which then leads on to you know, the next one, which are nasty su surprises. Um, ground conditions are always an issue. Um, statutory um, approvals, etc. Um, then some commercial things like cash flow problems, um, contractor um, errors um, causing subcontractor claims. Um, so there's, there's a whole ambit of um, items. Just wait till the next slide comes up. Um, and I think the last one that I really want to talk about is lack of collaboration, which can cause a whole lot, load of problems. Very often defects which um, occur on a project are down to, you know, a lack of collaboration in that, you know, it's a mixture of architects makes, you know, a minor error. You need something. Um, one of the other consultants misinterprets something, and then the contractor does something. So quite often, 
um, it's a lack of what I call lack of cooperation, a lack of communication um, between consultants on the one hand, contractor and the specialist subcontractor. So, you know, that that there's some of some of the reasons I'm sure. Um, you know, we, we've all we've all got some. Sometimes, unfortunately, you know, we just get into contracts with um, clients who really don't want to pay or want to pay as little as as they can, or um, they get into difficulties or overspending later on down the line. So, want to try and tighten the belt. So, what we're trying to do today is to think about things that we can do to avoid those issues. The first area that we're going to look at, you can get the slide on the screen. Um, yeah, measures to protect yourself. Um, so what I've said there is the pre-contract review. Um, you know, and what, what I would recommend is um, a pro forma. I'm not, I'm not one for forms and documents. Um, we, we have, we have far too many. Any of the main construction, but there we are. They're all they're all required. Um, but I think a contract review pro forma is a really useful thing to have, and I think it works all the way through project, not just whilst you're reviewing and negotiating your contract. So you have a pro forma, um, and I've got some clients who have the. Uh, you can include all the key issues that are relevant to you. Um, I listed. There's a whole raft here. Um, and, you know, hopefully as we go through um, the seminar this morning, you'll see, you know, why I think all this information is useful. Um, correct parties, the, the emphasis on the correct ones, um, the form of contract you're on, um, design responsibilities, so some of the, the kind of key um, contractual clauses, design responsibility, standard of care. For both design and workmanship, um, some of the commercial terms, so the payment dates, um, always useful to have that. Whether you're the paying party or the party wanting to be paid, you know, if you've got that set out in a nice chart, really clear to everyone who looks at it. I always remember going to a seminar and one of the top construction judges saying that he'd spent, you know, about three days or something ridiculous. Um, trying to work out what the JCT payment provisions are. Well, if you've got it in a nice flow chart with all the dates, et cetera, um, you know, then that's really easy for you um, and everyone in your organisation to use. Um, any limitation of liability, really important. Insurance requirements, um, other commercial issues, so liquidated damages, retention, um, also, you know, some of the key procedural issues, so um, conditions precedent, um, are there any? You know, these are um, basically, you know, I just... Hello, Sarah, can you hear me? Right, apologies, everyone. We seem to have lost Sarah. The sound seems to have given up. Um, I'm glad you can all hear me. However, I do not quite have the... Uh, technical expertise um, for this webinar so if you could just bear with me for one minute and I will try and get hold of Sarah 
and see if she can get back on. Apologies for this, everyone. I think this is probably our first major technical hitch that we've got going on. Please bear with me for one second and I'll just try and get in touch and let Sarah know that her Sam seems to have gone. Okay, apologies everyone, just bear with me for one moment. everyone just to let you know i've not completely disappeared i've just spoken to sarah yeah her computer's just had a bit of a a bit of a nightmare she is trying to come in just on another piece of kit so hopefully she'll be back on in a minute yeah and i know i know we've had slight issues with um a couple of sound connections before so i think i maybe need to go and sit outside her house with some kind of uh, 4G tower or 5G tower or something and make sure she can get on. But apologies for the delay, everyone. If anyone uh, needs to go make a fresh coffee, please feel free to just for a moment and hopefully Sarah will be back on in a second. Uh, to anyone who missed that, just, ooh, I think she's trying to come back in now through the app. Apologies for the delay. I should really have some kind of music teed up for this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, issue. But I can see Sarah trying to come back in now as a presenter. These are all the technological issues we didn't know we had until the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> Sarah, if you can hear me, we can now see that you're logged on. We just need the sound, I think.
Bear with me one moment, guys. I'll just try and get back into it. Right, so that should, so can you, we can, can you hear me now? Sarah, yes. Uh, right, really, really sorry folks, um, where were we? Um, um, okay, and the, the last, this is, so we're on the pro, pro form of all your key, key provisions, the last kind of section um, are those extra documents. Um, so bonds, um, collateral warranties, parent company guarantees, but also things like, is there a program attached um, to the contract? And also one might sound stupid, but what's the specification that's attached to the contract? You know, what's the works information um, or contractors, um, employers requirements, contractors proposals, uh, because, um, it does it does happen where people enter into a contract and it's not clear what scope of work is so Looking at um, to protect yourself, um, just some real basics here. First of all, is the contract agreed and executed? Um, the executed obviously of, often sometimes gets missed out. Um, particularly if you're on a letter of intent, just make sure that you keep an eye on it. It's really, really easy um, to get into um, the work and forget about finalising the contract. Um, and ensure that the relevant people are familiar with the relevant provisions. So this goes back to your pro forma. Um, very often what you find is that in an organisation with contractors, subcontractors, um, one, one section of the business is responsible for quoting for the work, negotiating the contract, etc. Then um, the contracts weren't signed, executed, and it goes to another team. And that's where I think this pro forma can be um, re reused um, into something else to help those people who've not been involved in the negotiation of the contract, but it helps give them a really clear picture as to what their responsibilities are, which um, then follow, um, this next slide follows on from that. Um, in terms of diarising key dates, well, if you've got your payment dates set it out in your pro forma, that's easy for your site staff to do. Um, know where your conditions precedent are, ditto if it's in your pro forma. Um, also, the procedures for variations, extensions of time, etc. What do you need to submit? Um, because if you know that, 
Um, it means that when um, an event occurs and you need to make a submission, um, you know what you need to submit and you're not going to be faced with a situation where you're on the back foot all the time. Also, make sure that when there is any handover that the technical risks um, are known to everyone and passed on. Um, and as I say, you know, use use that contract pro forma um, and and recycle it so that it can be used throughout um, the project. Now, I was going to talk a little bit about letters of intent, but actually in August, we're going to do a full seminar on letters of intent. So all I'm going to say um, on letters of intent um, is um, obviously be careful about them. Um, there are two types. Be really, really careful of type, the old fashioned type that we used to see a lot of, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago where it was just literally two or three lines um, where clients say, you know, we're going to enter into a contract with you at some stage in the future. Um, but in the meantime, can you get on with, um, you know, site investigation work or whatever it is? Be really careful because technically that probably isn't a legally binding arrangement between the two parties. It's basically um, just... Um, the developer um, asking the contractor for a favour if matters don't proceed beyond that work. Um, what we tend to see more now is this proper legally binding letter of intent, which is usually two, three, four pages and contains all the terms that you need. And what you're thinking about here is what if I don't sign a proper contract? Um, at some point in the future, this letter needs to contain all the terms that I need. Um, and critically for contractors and subcontractors, we're talking about getting paid um, and getting extra money um, if any extras occur or um, client doesn't give information that's needed, etc. So just bear that in mind. Um, if letters of intent are of interest to you, um, come along to the August um, webinar. So in terms of your contract, what, what can you do to protect yourself? Well, there are, there are lots of things that you can do. Um, the key one that I've put in here um, is just about conditions precedent, which we've already touched upon. It's a the really, really popular provisions in construction contracts now. It, 10, 10, 15 years ago, the courts weren't interested in enforcing them. They are now. Um, and really, they probably started with um, the NEC form of contract, where we see our favourite condition precedent, which is the requirement in the contract that you've got to notify a compensation event within eight weeks. Um, if you don't, um, then strictly speaking, you're not going to get any money or any time. So that's that's why they're so important. Um, and obviously, it's why they're so, so popular with developers and obviously, of course, contractors um, in their subcontracts. For employers um, or for, for, for paying parties, so again, it includes contractors in subcontracts, just be careful about your payment notices. Um, and you pay less notices because, as we know, um, if you don't submit them, then the chances are you may be subject to a smash and grab adjudication, um, which is it's it's not phrased as a condition precedent, but it it works in a similar way. So you don't get your notice in, um, and the the adjudicator um, will. Um, most likely say that you've got to pay the sum that's been applied for um, by the party um, the, the party um, wanting to be paid. So it sort of works like a condition precedent in that it's a failure to submit a notice means that you've got to pay big chunks of money that you wouldn't ordinarily have done have wanted to do. Um, just bear in mind with contract clauses generally, even if it's not a condition precedent um, or it doesn't say if you don't comply with this you don't get paid if you don't comply with your contract clauses then you are still in breach of contract and 
um, still liable to pay any losses flowing from that breach. Um, so just be careful of that. Don't be, be lulled into a false sense of security that it's only conditions precedent that have an impact. So for contractors and subcontractors, some measures to protect yourself. Well, um, obviously one is limiting your liability. Um, to do this, um, you need to have a very clearly worded clause um, in your contract. So just be careful because um, it's extremely unlikely that such a clause will come in a contract when you're being invited to tender for work. It's usually a clause you are going to have to negotiate into the contract and therefore you need to make sure it gets into that contract. Um, for example, if you negotiate it um, and it doesn't actually, um, the, you know, the, the actual words don't get into the contract, then it's probably got, not going to be any good to you. So just some of the ways you can limit your liability, well, you can limit the time you're liable. So typically in a construction contract, you are liable for any defects after practical completion for either six or 12 years, depending on whether you've signed the contract as a simple contract, six years, or as a deed, 12 years. So there's nothing to stop you um, putting in a clause that says, you know, notwithstanding that this contract's executed as a deed, i.e. 12 year liability, um, you know, the contractor's liability ends two years after practical completion, for example. Um, you can limit your liability in monetary terms. So a common provision that you see is that um, the contract will have no greater liability um, than the, the contract sum. Um, that's just an arbitrary figure. It just seems to be um, the, the, the um, commercial norm. You could put in, you could have a, um, a completely different figure. Um, and also one that is fairly common is limiting um, liability for consequential losses. Be careful with this one because consequential loss doesn't have a specific meaning at law, you need to make sure you define what loss it covers. Um, and typically it should include loss of profit um, and um, loss of opportunity to have any real benefit. Just want to talk about your agreements um, both pre and post contract because um, what I find is that parties often get in a bit of a muddle in both respects. So, what we're we talking about, well, we're talking about when you're entering into a contract, not the situation um, where you've got lawyers involved negotiating the contract, but where um, you are sort of negotiating it between yourselves. Clauses are going to and fro. Um, sometimes there's discussion about going on site and starting work. Um, sometimes that happens and then there's a little bit of a muddle because there's no signed contract. Terms and conditions were still being negotiated between the parties. Um, and it then becomes slightly unclear, sometimes very unclear, as to what the contract terms are. Um, so, first of all, be careful about your offer and acceptance. Um, make sure that you're clear that when you are negotiating, none of that is an acceptance. What can turn it into an acceptance is if um, a party then um, goes on to site and starts working, that can mean that it's an acceptance of the terms and conditions that, ex that, that exist at that point. It can get into a bit of a muddle if, for example, you're negotiating your terms and conditions, you start on site and then those negotiations continue because that probably means you haven't got an agreed contract. So just be aware of that particularly if you're negotiating, you start on site um, and 
actually you've gone on site thinking that the terms and conditions have been agreed and then the other party start to try to um, continue negotiation. If you engage in that negotiation, then more than likely you will be deemed to be effectively agreeing that the terms and conditions hadn't been agreed when you went to site. Um, the obvious one, try to keep everything in writing. I know it's really difficult, um, but um, you know, even if you're having a telephone call, the ideal is you drop an email confirming what's been discussed. Um, or you know you, you, you've got no real evidence except your own memory, um, and that's that's never great um, if there's a dispute. Um, make make sure um, what what you say, what you cover in contracts is clear. Um, ditto emails and that it's correct. Um, clarify any areas of uncertainty. Um, the same with instructions and variations. You know anything. Um, that's that said it needs to be confirmed in writing um, and of course contracts often require um, any amendments to be in writing or they're not valid um, so looking at recording agreements um, so in terms of priority I mean a contract obviously you know that's that's the top that's the best we can get um, and usually contracts will say that anything that's not part of the contract isn't the contract. So that means it's very, very difficult to say later on down the line if there's a dispute. Um, well, the contract says this or the contract says has this document in it. But when we were negotiating, we discussed a different scenario um, and it was agreed in the correspondence. But that correspondence hasn't been incorporated into the contract. So make sure that the contract is all inclusive. It covers everything. Um, aside from that, I do appreciate that on a day to day basis, you may be um, reaching agreements on items that, that aren't going to be included in a formal um, agreement. So in that respect, um, you know, the the, the, the best kind of document there to prove your agreement, to establish it, um, will be a letter, an email, a text even, um, something that has been communicated to the other party. Um, why does it need to be communicated? Well, primarily because obviously a contract signed between both parties indicating they both agree. If you've sent a letter or an email, you've given the other party the opportunity to come back and say, actually, no, that's not what we agreed. And if they don't, or if they do agree with you, um, then everything should be okay. Programs, drawing pl drawings and plans um, can often form agreements. If a program is sent um, to a party um, and they're told, you know, please comply with this program, um, and they do, then effectively there's been a request to comply with the programme um, and if you comply with it then you're basically agreeing to it. Um, photographs, this is more in the way of evidence um, to, to, to evidence a claim. Um, minutes of meeting, we're going to come to them um, later. Um, just a note about internal notes, so diary entries, um, internal emails etc. Be careful because you know, they're specifically at the bottom of this list because they're not correspondence, they're not in that correspondence section. And what did we think was important about that? Well, it's important because in correspondence, it goes to the other party, they have the opportunity to query or dispute it. Um, with internal notes, they don't have that same opportunity. So it has less of an evidential value. We've sort of looked at acceptance by conduct, um, which is the um, actually taking an action, so going on to site and starting work or complying with a drawing or a, a, a programme, etc. And you know, particularly where the other party knows um, and sees um, that party actually complying and carrying out that work. Um, so going to site, everybody knows um, a party um, started work on site. Um, that is a really good way of kind of finalising a contract um, on the basis that there's acceptance by conduct.
Okay, so this kind of follows on. I'm just going to quickly skim through this. Um, this follows on from what we've just been talking about. So it sort of merges from agreements into evidence. Um, evidence is basically um, anything that supports your case. So, you know, we, we would hope that it's something in writing. Um, because if it isn't, or something in a tangible form, because if it isn't, we're relying on witness evidence, which quite often isn't very reliable, because at the end of the day, not many of us can remember what we were doing, for example, um, six months ago, 12 months ago. So um, you need your records to support your claims, um, not only to support liability, i.e., you know, typically you'd be looking at your contract to show this isn't part of our scope, we were asked to do it, um, and therefore we're entitled to more money and more time. Um, but your project documents support your entitlement um, to, um, act to, to or, or assist in showing your entitlement um, with regard to um, the financial implication um, and also the time scales. And again, you know, another shout out for pro formas, for variations, et cetera. I think, you know, it just makes things easy. Um, yeah, with, with your documentation. So this is all the documentation. You know, I suppose bear in mind, you, you know, you, you are producing it on behalf of um, your employer. So, you know, bear in mind your professional obligations, you know, keep calm keep cool and um, keep professional um, because you just never know who's going to be looking at that paperwork at some point in the future um, to either support or otherwise um, a claim that one of the parties is um, making. Just a, a note about minutes of meeting. Um, if you have meetings it might sound really really obvious this, but if you have meetings do prepare minutes of meeting or make sure someone does make sure they're circulated and um, if you're not preparing them make sure you check them um, it can cause real problems I know it's a real tedious thing to do um, to have to just read through pages and pages um, of minutes but it can cause real issues based on the fact that we've already seen that if you have a document that is sent to um, the other party and they don't query it, then they can be deemed to have accepted it. Um, so if you don't check your minutes of meeting, if you don't highlight errors, then you may be deemed to have accepted things and that may mean that you're deemed to have accepted um, some entitlement or other um, on behalf of the other the other party. So, if you have a dispute that's arisen or a dispute that is arising, um, one of the things that I think you do need to do is to think about where it might go. Um, and this isn't, as I said earlier, I'm not going to talk about you know the the merits, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each, um, but um, I don't think you can devise a negotiation and settlement strategy unless you have a clear idea as to where it might go um, if that doesn't succeed um, because it just means that your negotiations become a little bit half-hearted and without any direction. So um, we have adjudication. Um, we can have a merits adjudication where you just go into the detail, prove, prove your case, um, provide all the substantiation, all the stuff we've been talking about. Um, or, sorry, that's a typo, should be merits or smash and grab. And we've touched on smash and grab as well. And hopefully you can see very quickly that which one you choose to, which one you think you might go down, you know, will, you know, have a real impact on how you negotiate um, in advance because for example with a smash and grab you might not negotiate at all um, but equally you know if you don't check if you don't look into this you might miss an opportunity so you might try to negotiate 
um, looking at the merits where in reality you might be wanting to negotiate and saying to your opponent well you know we can we can bring a smash and grab adjudication here um, which might help your negotiations along a bit and um, court proceedings typically that would be with um, defects claims rather than with account claims um, you might want to think about mediation particularly if your contract says that the parties should consider it a contract wouldn't force parties to mediate because mediate's all about settling um, but just using a, an independent third party to assist in that settlement so of course you can't be forced to settle something um, but um, you know that's quite a nice tactical one if you want to mediate and a contract clause says you should then you can put pressure on um, your opponent to mediate and they're more inclined to agree. There's the pre-action protocol um, process, which is the precursor to court proceedings. Now, you can use this for any claim. So even if you're intending to adjudicate, you could use the pre-action protocol as a way to try and negotiate. Very simply, the process is you send a letter of claim and we'll look at that a little bit later on. Um, the your opponent has twenty eight days to respond, and after that, you're obliged to consider whether um, you can um, meet to discuss and try and negotiate. So that's often the end goal. Um, you know, getting some face to face meeting and some negotiations, particularly if um, your opponent hasn't been willing to engage in any negotiations up to then and um, you know if you're reluctant to adjudicate or if you think that your opponent hasn't really understood your case or you hasn't explained their case fully sometimes the protocol um, is a good way to um, get information um, from the other party or be able to give information in in a way that is is fairly formal and therefore you know they may be more inclined to look at it and take it seriously and um, the, the the last point is um don't forget that if you have an admission of liability um you know that is an admission so you don't need to be thinking about liability and um, you just need to be thinking about the quantum and the monetary, monetary side of things if for example a claim has been fully admitted both on liability and quantum um then you know you might just want to um push the dispute on the basis that there is an agreement and um the other party just hasn't stuck to it um i'm going to skim through um these because i think we've pretty much touched on adjudication to the extent that we need to um, and the smash and grab um, I mean if, if I mean there's been a lot of it in the press in the last 18 months or so to say that smash and grab is 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 um, dead and buried well it's not um, you know it's it's still it's still there it's probably slightly limited um, but you know, not not too much. It's still only available in certain situations. But you know, it is it is worth pursuing. So, moving on to negotiation, and I do think, as I've already said, that it's important to think about where you're going to go with adjudication, court proceedings, etc. Um, when you start negotiating when you're devising your strategy. So negotiation and your strategy, you know, are really two separate things, I think. Um, your strategy is usually going to be very broadly, well, we'll negotiate this. And if we don't get a resolution, the next step is whatever it is. Um, um, and you probably have a slightly more detailed strategy than that. Um, but in terms of your negotiation, um, what you need to do, well, you need to work out what your dispute is. Um, and obviously, you need to do that to work out your strategy, particularly um, if, if you're going to go down the smash and grab route, for example. 
Um, the other thing to think about in terms of strategy is are there any easy wins? So, you know, you may have a number of compensation events, variations that haven't been paid, but there might be one obvious one to pursue. And the advantage of adjudication is that you can cherry pick and just pursue the one which might be quicker, um, easier, cheaper. Um, get a good, good win on that one. Um, and then that might persuade um, the other side to come to the table and discuss the others. Um, if you are a developer, an employer, um, and there's a possibility a smash and grab adjudication might be commenced against you, particularly if it's a big figure, you might want to consider a tactical preemptive adjudication for merits, um, because obviously once an adjudicator has determined um, a matter on the merits, there's absolutely no point in doing a smash and grab. Um, you know, think about do you want to negotiate? Is it always a good idea? Um, my view is that it, it's 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 never a waste of time to you know to give it a shot. What I would say is though, don't waste loads of time if the other party isn't willing to negotiate or is delaying unreasonably which effectively means they're not willing to negotiate move on you know move to the next um, part of your strategy um, would you negotiate with smash and grab it depends on the circumstances um, sometimes parties just like to um, get the adjudication started um, to give the other party little opportunity to think about it um, but um, you know, it, it may be useful because at the end of the day, following a smash and grab, particularly for a large sum, it's unlikely to be the end of things. So you're more you're most likely to find that um, there's a follow on merits adjudication. So, you know, in some respects, um, it is it is often worth negotiating um, before you start your smash and grab because it might mean that you just get both parties agreeing to cut to the chase and agree a, set, a, a, a sensible deal um, on the project rather than having two adjudications, smash and grab and then merits. Um, review your strategy regularly. Um, in particular, um, review your timescales. Don't get sucked into um, ever ongoing negotiations that never come to an end or never and never go anywhere. Um, consider sharing timescales. I think that is a good thing to do um, because if you've if you've got the checkbook, your interest is going to be in delaying having any negotiations for as long as you possibly can. Um, so if somebody is approaching you and saying, we'd like to discuss this with you, we'd like to reach a, a resolution amicably, um, you know, if we can do so within the next X days, that would be great. If we can't, then, you know, we're going to have to take this um, to some form of dispute resolution or we're going to have to, you know, move, move f um, forward with this um, outside of any negotiations. And um, then, you know, you're setting clear boundaries and parameters. Um, and as we've seen already, you know, if you get a settlement, even if it's just on part of a claim, make well, particularly if it's just on part of a claim, make sure it's recorded in writing and shared um, with, with the other party. So what might your strategy cover? Well, when you're getting into a dispute, you might want to set out your claim fully. Um, I think that has a number of benefits. Sometimes parties, both parties really don't really um, think about a claim in any detail. Um, and sometimes, um, sometimes I get claims and um, parties have simply sent a claim form as in, you know, compensation event notice and that's it. That's the extent to which um, they've considered it. So consider it, I think, as an exercise 
it is always quite good to set it out formally in writing um, because there's a certain discipline there. You know, you need to then think about, well, which contract clauses am I relying on? Which bit of the scope does this relate to? Um, what, you know, why do I say um, extra money um, is to be paid, etc. cetera? Um, and hopefully um, it makes you focus on um, the strengths of the claim, but also the weaknesses. Um, and ditto um, the strengths of your opponent's arguments and their weaknesses as well, which is always a good discipline to get into. Um, also, um, doing this forces you to look at your project documentation, see how it supports um, your claim, because that can have an impact. If that's really poor, um, then your strategy might not look as if um, you know, you're too keen to go to adjudication because if you've got no backup documentation, it's going to be quite difficult. And um, if you have got the backup documentation, why not show it off? Um, you know, if you're going to set send um, de a detailed claim in, um, show show the project documentation, show um, you know that good evidence that you've you've managed to um, collate through the project. Also, really important, think about who you're going to negotiate with. Um, I always think it's best when it comes to a certain stage in negotiations to try and escalate things to a higher level, in probably in both organisations. Um, take it away from you know, that very personal level where people have um, their own individual interests and take it up to a level where... Um, you know, the, the directors, for example, might um, have a slightly different agenda. They might want to just get it resolved quickly. They might want things to stay amicable, etc. cetera. Um, tactics, you know, think about what, what will cause your opponent the most difficulty. So, for example, um, court proceedings, if You contract proceedings as opposed to arbitration, um, open to the public. That might not be something that your opponent would be keen. So, you know, if that was the case, you know, you might want to be talking about court proceedings uh, because that might certainly get them to think about negotiating. Obviously, think about future work, future relationships. Um, if you can, if you're a contractor, Get information, supporting documents, evidence from your subcontractors. Um, and also bear in mind that some firms, some businesses um, are um, more, more litigious than others. So some you know, tend to be um, more up for a fight than others. And sometimes, you, you know, you might want to take that into account in your negotiations, particularly if you, know, you do get into negotiations and there are offers, counter offers, and you get quite close. So content of a letter of claim, and this probably ties in, it probably mirrors what pretty much what your action protocol um would cover so the purpose of the letter you know if you set that out clearly at the start it's a really really good start to the letter and um, keep it very high level um you know basically you know you're writing to explain um to set out the details of the claim so that they understand it you're hoping that they will do the same in response um, you're also um, aiming to try to resolve things by negotiation, but if that can't happen, you know, within a set time scale, um, then, um, you know, in all likelihood, you'll be, you know, taking the matter to adjudication, or you might want to keep it more vague than that. Um, then move on to the nature of the claim. So it's a claim for unpaid variations or extension of time, loss and expense, whatever. Um, set out the details. Um, put the financial impact in um, and then bear in mind of course that people who will read this might not be particularly familiar with the project particularly if things are being escalated to director level and um, then go through the history of the claim you know that's your opportunity to refer to 
um, you know, the evidence that you've got, your project documents, et cetera. Um, and obviously refer to any contract provisions that you rely on. Um, if if and hoping that you've complied with any no notification um, requirements in the contract, you know, again, make that point, show off, explain that you have complied um, and you know, explain how um, your quantum, how your delay is calculated. Um, again, if you've got the documentation, hopefully you have um, exhibit it, show it um, in the letter. Um, and then you're at the stage of that's my claim. So right, what do we do to move on? Um, so you know, it might be giving alternatives. As I say, give deadlines. Um, so the alternatives may be you either pay in full or we can meet within the next ten days. You know, let me let me have a date that suits you within the next ten days. Um, you might want to check the dispute resolution clauses in your contract particularly to see if there's a mediation clause or sometimes contracts require or suggest that the parties do escalate the dispute if there is one which is you know quite a nice way to a get that get that negotiation going um, and also tactically it's quite nice because it shows the other party that you're looking at your contract, you understand what it says, and you're planning ahead. You know, you have a strategy. It's not just, a, well, can we negotiate? Um, but, you know, there's there's nothing there. You know, there's no indication that there's any strategy after that. Um, and as I've said, consider badging it um, a pre action letter. So for your settlement meetings, um, I mean, that is the key thing. I think so often um, people go into settlement meetings and they haven't properly prepared quite often because they're thinking, well, we'll just have another one in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I think it's re really important to prepare, review your strategy, which is why it's quite good to have it in writing, review your letter of claim. If you haven't sent one, make sure that you've ticked off all those items that we've been through and that you can you can cover all those items in the meeting um, and also critically consider your opponent's arguments um, and be ready at the meeting and positively go into the meeting with the aim of addressing their arguments um, rather than just dismissing them and you know as, as some people do in um, so-called negotiations um, basically say, well, you know, I'm not even going to consider your arguments. I'm not even going to discuss them or whatever. Um, consider um, sending an agenda for the meeting in advance. It sets the tone. It, it shows that, you know, you're, you're taking it seriously. You're preparing for it, et cetera. And hopefully um, we'll avoid the situation where you've prepared and your opponent hasn't at all. Consider the logistics. Are you willing to go um, to your opponent's office or is that not possible, et cetera? At the meeting, take notes and issue um, some minutes or some notes afterwards. Um, and of course, stay calm. And I think really important, ask questions. You know, sometimes um, negotiations form a, you know, well, this is my case, I'm going to shout about it or talk about it as much as I can. Um, and then I'm going to switch off whilst you're doing the same with your case. Um, and I think sometimes it's, it's a good mechanism to ask questions to get your opponent to think about, um, you know, what, what their position is um, on issues. So, in summary, um, be commercial, um, as always. Um, follow the contract that's been negotiated. Um, be careful where you're getting into negotiations, whatever um, stage of the project. Um, if you reach a resolution to all or part of it, put that in writing, even if it is only um, interim issues partway through the project. Um, record keeping 
it's really boring, but it is so, so important. It's absolutely critical um, in construction matters. Um, and I think it's probably, it's one of the things why um, you know, we in construction have a dedicated court. We have the Technology and Construction Court um, because um, our disputes do tend to be very, very document heavy compared to other disputes. Um, so be really, really careful about that. As I say, it is tedious, but you can make it simple for your people um, by having pro formas, you know, making things easy so that they just have to fill things in um, rather than creating them from scratch. Be organised. Um, all this applies cradle to grave, but particularly um, with your negotiations. Um, and that's everything for today really sorry i cut out i'm sorry that i've gone over a little bit um but i don't think i've done too bad um in view of the little glitch um i'm trying to see if we've got any questions um hello i don't think we've had any questions in as of yet but if anyone does have any so I think Gemma's gonna, Gemma's gonna... yeah if anyone does have any questions feel free to add them in um, just now whilst we've got Sarah on the line. Um, if not, then I think we'll probably be free to go. I'll just give people a minute if they want to type anything in. But if not, while we're doing that, um, I'll just remind for people who joined a little bit late if you would like a copy of the slides, I've had a couple of emails so far. If you would like a copy of the slides, please drop me an um, email through. Sorry, we've just had one question that I will bring up for you here, Sarah, from Mark. Yeah, the um, haven't seen it. Well, I haven't. Nothing's gone to adjudication. It's it's way too early for that. Um, I am seeing claims, a mixture of things with COVID, where extensions of time are being granted. Somewhere they're being refused. Um, I think what people are maybe forgetting about is that just because we have COVID doesn't mean that an automatic right to an extension of time and and more money and um, with jct it's just time typically it sort of depends but generally um with nec you should get time and money but um you have got to show that the virus has caused delay so with some projects i think that's that's not necessarily a given with a lot it is you know if if contracts have um, genuinely, you know, had to stop work or suspend because of the virus, that's fine. Um, I think some are being rejected on a suspicion that it's not, that the suspension or the delay wasn't actually down to COVID. It was down to quite often an existing delay. Um, so that's what we're seeing. What we have seen as well, just this is court proceedings, um, and it's more to do with service of documents where a party didn't respond to proceedings that had been issued because they hadn't they hadn't received them because everything went to their office and they weren't in the office so judgment was entered against them now what the court has done on that is that it's set the judgment aside so it's allowing them to defend um now if you were um here for the seminar that I did on COVID, I did say when you're issuing notices and claims, you know, do do the right thing and serve it in accordance with the contract. But also, particularly with JCT, where services um, by post, um, my advice is the whole point of a notice is to tell somebody about something. So email people as well, email the people that you are liaising with. Otherwise, it might just look as if you're trying to um, serve a notice, but 
um, without the other party seeing it, which judicators, courts, judges, they, they don't um, they don't like that, um, as you'll maybe understand. Um, we've got another um, one about disputes arising out of the adverse weather in February. I haven't actually. That's a really good point. Um, what I would say, which you, you you won't want to hear, I suspect, if you're a contractor or subcontractor, is that um, typically the NEC compensation event, um, you know, it says that you can make a claim for weather, but the criteria makes it really, really difficult. It's got to be really, really bad weather. Um, so I'm I'm sure we've had worse weather than we had in February. Um, so I'm not sure. Of course, what it depends depends on because I think this would be the the flooding of course it depends on the locality and um, where the project was um, so I haven't seen any um, but the criteria is fairly strict if you're on JCT there's probably a little bit more wriggle room um, but with NEC it's fairly prescriptive excellent uh, thank you Sarah um, I don't think we've had any other questions come through as of yet however i have had about seven or eight people asking for a copy of the slides so i will endeavor to get those over to you um along with any cpd certificates that you have requested um it'll probably be later tonight or tomorrow morning if that's okay for everyone thank you very much to you sarah for um delivery today despite our um, mild technical hitch and thank you so much to everyone listening um, for sticking with us